All right, it's a great pleasure. We've got uh, U.S. Olympic swimming legend Jessica Hardy Mike Tree. How are you doing? Doing great. Good to see you. It's just, yeah, this you is too. fun. Yeah, yeah, catching up. You know, it's uh, it's Olympic year. Everybody's buzzing again about swimming. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, I think. I mean, we're always buzzing about it, but <laughs> it's cool. I mean, this year is extra special with people getting pumped up with such a short turnaround time between Tokyo too, and I mean. I mean, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, it'll be super fun. Um, kind of wanted to catch up with you and talk about your career. Part of what I do here on this podcast is is talk about legends, um, their careers and how they started, what they went through, and some some things we can learn uh, along the way. Um, so we'll kind of just get into it, I guess. I mean, uh, when I was talking to my fiance last night, Carrie. Carrie Congratulations, Hayes. by the way. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, it is awesome. Um, she's she's so cool. Yeah, she's really good, and she loves you. And and I was I was saying, okay, tell me about Jess. Like, what what do I need to know? She's like, the first thing she said was like, she was fast from the day she was born. Like, she, <laughs> she just had speed, that girl. Um, and and that's awesome. And that's kind of made me the first question I want to ask you is like, did did people recognize that in you early? Uh, and is it something that you think we can recognize in kids younger? That's a hard question. I first of all, I love your fiance also, mm, possibly mm. more than you. She's awesome, <laughs> and we had such a good time training together. Um, yeah. You know, mostly talking more than training half the time, mm. but she's awesome. You got a really yeah. good one, um, and I think yeah, I think she says that because she was more of a two hundred breaststroker, and I had to learn a lot from her on how to pace myself and um, yeah, approach races with more intellect than just kind of going out and dying. But I'm um, really grateful for her and, and definitely had that sprinter kind of mentality as a kid. But as an age grouper, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to talk to you about how it compares to growing up in Australia. Um, I think, you know, now on this side of it, I've gone through the coaches training and from USA Swimming and the the portals, the training courses, they all say, you know, how to build your, your age group program is mm. it's distance oriented, you know, even mm. from the beginning. So as a kid, I grew up in our age group programs here in the U S and I sucked. I really was not good. Um, couldn't do the workouts. I would get out, hide, quit, throw up. I just mm. couldn't do them. Um, so my parents got divorced and when we moved to long beach, which was like kind of not a great swimming area, um, but a really good water polo area, like half the Olympic team is from my high school, um, on the water polo team, you know, at least back when I was competing. And when I came to this environment where kind of, they trained with more creative approaches and less, less distance. Um, mm. that's where I started to thrive. I got really good. Mm. What, what age was that? Uh, when you, when you moved then moved there in eighth grade, I think I was 13 around 13. Okay. Yeah. So what age did you actually start swimming? Uh, I think I fell in a pool at three yeah. and my mom put me in lessons around then. Right. And right. I think age group swimming at like six, seven, you know? Yeah. Okay. It's so yeah. So cool. like from, from about, you know, let's say seven or eight to, to 13, you felt like most of the work you did didn't fit you. It didn't relate to you. It was just, it was just distant stuff. It was just about gaining fitness of some sort. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was on the Mission Viejo Natadors as a kid, which mm. is notorious for being one of the biggest distance clubs. But, you know, as a kid looking at that team, they had a really good com camaraderie. So yep. that's why I joined. I wanted that team atmosphere. Um, but I found out pretty quickly that I couldn't. I, I literally got put in their novice group, um, you know, as like mm. one of their best breaststrokers on the team at the time. And, <laughs> you know, I just wasn't I wasn't able to keep up with the workouts. Um, yeah. I remember I. I barely stayed in the sport, to be honest, during that time frame. And mm. if, yeah, I'm a survivor. <laughs> I'm a survivor yeah. of the Matadors. <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel the same way. And I know you reached out to me, um, you know, on social media a few days ago when I was talking about this myself in terms of like, I hid in the showers, you know, yeah. as an age grouper, that's just what I did. And then, and I, and I don't think that's something that many people talk about, you know, yeah. we talk about um, going through and kind of dealing with it and, and people, um, you know, just look at it as a rite of passage almost like you have to do that in order to get to where you want to be. And and I was yeah. always of the opinion of like, why am I doing this? Like what is happening? And and I'll just go and hide. And I felt like I made it through because I hid, you know? Yeah. 
I reposted your post when you posted that. And <laughs> I had, I think, 20 people, elite, elite swimmers, reach out mm. to me too, that they did that too. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting approach. Um, you know, I think our sport has traditionally been a distance oriented, you know, approach to training. Yep. And mm. um, I'm friends with Lydia Jacoby, the really good breaststroker who's still mm. competing now. And she was coached by a track coach up in Alaska in high school. And he came, mm with a different approach and she did less yardage than I ever did and, and won an Olympic yeah. gold medal. So yeah. I don't know if, if track's the right answer, it's not necessarily like the best sport to be <laughs> trying to, um, you know, copy, but I do really appreciate their outside the box approach to training and not over, um, I guess, over training their athletes, I think over hurting them. And, and, yeah. you know, I don't know. Swimming needs a little bit of that mindset. We do. Yeah. we do. And I'm pushing hard on that, obviously. Um, when do you think you were first recognized then as, as invalidated as a sprinter? It wasn't until my 20s, to be completely wow. truthful. Really? That late? Um, <clears throat> I knew training wise, I couldn't handle as much as a lot of anyone else I knew growing up. Um, but as a breaststroker, because my feet pointed outward, that's the stroke I, I was good at first. Um, they don't let you swim sprint events as a breaststroker. You have to be a hundred, 200 or, you know, you have mm. to, and then they throw you in the 200 IM as your third event. And the 200 IM is hard. It's like, it's a, it's a middle distance event of all the strokes. And I mean, there's nothing sprint in my opinion, everyone says it's the sprint of all the strokes, but in my opinion, <laughs> it's the distance event of all the strokes. And mm. um, I know the 400 IM is probably way worse. I've never even done it, but I, I, I just, I survived those years of trying to combine those three events and was only really ever good at the hundred breaststroke until I think I, so I, I had already left Berkeley. Um, so I was 21 when I left. Um, and I went to swim with Mike Bottom in the Florida Keys to visit Dom, my husband, who's a Swiss mm. Olympian. Um, and Mike Bottom threw me in a lot of 50 freestyle um, stations, you know, that he had going yeah. on where there was not a huge group there. But I came back and I made Olympic trials in the 50 free like the, that week when I got back. And then I had a blast. <laughs> I was like, let's try this and kept swimming freestyle and made the Olympic team like two years later in the 100 and the 50 free in 2008. So happened wow. really fast. Yeah. But in your 20s, it's kind of like your maximum Crazy. strength phase. You know, I had I had the strength um, more than I had ever had in my career to, to swim freestyle, but had fun with that. That was fun. This is the part that really saddened me, Jess. You know, it's like it's like we're talking to an Olympic legend, one of the greatest sprinters in history, and it wasn't until you made a move from college to and, and by chance met up with a guy like Mark Bottom who believes in sprinting and has this influence on you, and then all of a sudden your career just changes like that. You know, it's like yeah. and I had I had similar experiences with with David Marsh. David Marsh yeah. did very similar to me with me. So you know, my fight here is how do we recognize the the you and the me's and the Jason Lezaks and the people that that are pure sprinters? How do we recognize these people earlier? Because it, it feels like to me that you and I just kind of escaped and, and fell through the cracks and just and just by chance, you know, found these programs that that, um, you know, catered to who we were and, and nurtured us in a way. But it, it's it seems like it's by chance. Right. Yeah, that's why I'm curious to see your perspective if Australia is any better because um, it seems more recently your sprinters, your top sprinters on the female side are especially having more success. And I think in, in America, a lot of people get caught up in just doing things the way that it's always been done and going through the age group ranks and then the NCAA program is just kind of it's stagnant a little bit. Um, you know, in Australia, they have more smaller training groups, more professional from my perspective, professional minded, you know, training groups. Um, so I think that that's really an environment that allows sprinters to thrive and having more specific um, approach to training and recognizing when someone's good at sprinting. And and I think the biggest thing is a coach thinks that the athlete's being lazy when they, <laughs> they try to pick the sprint group. Um, so yeah. really empowering age groupers to, you know, allow them to train for sprinting, but not guilting them that they're that they're lazier than the other athletes you know i think that's mm, kind mm, of the, the tightrope yes. that, you know, that, that we happens have. a lot doesn't it that that guilting of like you're lazy if you have this if sprinters mentality it's like we know we know we have it inside us and it's like we we're shamed you know it's yeah. like there's this shaming of of who we are and what we want to be and yeah and um there and like you said like you're put in 
events that don't suit you just because for whatever reason I, th I think in america from what i've heard especially in age group is that you know clubs are competing for points and for these these titles of gold gold medal club silver club bronze and all this sort of stuff and and so what i've heard is that they try and put their athletes in as many events as they possibly can to score as many points for the club so they can become these and i think that perpetuates the problem of like just killing these athletes to swim multiple events rather than being able to specialize to say hey i i just want to be called a sprinter and, and i'm okay if you put me in all the 50s or all the hundreds but i don't want to be swimming 200s and 400 ims and 500 freestyles and things like that i want to sprint you know yeah yeah and if that kid comes from a family of like my mom is six too like my age group coaches should have known i could have been a sprinter you know i'm not <laughs> trying to be lazy i yeah. mean i'm physically built to be a sprinter so yeah. I think you know if it's if it's a founded argument with good stuff behind it i think yeah they they need to be receptive of that i yeah. mean i'm grateful for all you're doing to help advocate for it for sure yeah i'm definitely pushing hard and i think there's there's definitely um you know there's two sides of it I, i'm lucky i guess because i i swam in an olympic final uh, so I, I have that experience and then i i coached athletes to obviously swim in olympic finals and win medals and and break world records in sprint events so I have that to fall back on where, where anyone that comes after me kind of is a little bit more hesitant than is if if I was saying these things as somebody who didn't have kind of that resume, I would be getting crucified, you know, like yeah. I'd be getting torn to pieces. But I yeah. think people are a little bit more hesitant because I've had success in those areas that they they don't attack me as much. But there's definitely a feel that I, I still feel isolated in this. Now, now I know it's, it's great to talk to people like you and and I've even had you know, like Jason Lezak and other people comment and, and, and connect. But I, ju I just feel like as, as a, um, an ideology, as a movement, it's just not accepted still. You know, the acceptance is we've got to go to 10 workouts a week by the age of 15 and you've got to be swimming two hours each workout. That's still kind of the accepted ideology, isn't it? Yeah, and I think people are afraid, afraid of what would happen if they switch that up a little bit you know i think they all want to outwork each other and approach their mm. their competitions like we're the best prepared for this because we did the most work and that's not i mean you're working yeah. harder not smarter in my opinion so that's not always yeah. the best approach so you have this experience with mike bottom kind of initiates it and then you move to dave solo and, and your career kind of takes off what what did you find with solo that really connected with you I grew up swimming with Salo too before college um, okay. and I broke world record in high school with him. So I had success oh. with him in the hundred breaststroke um, as a high schooler and really connected, clicked well with his outside the box training approach. Um, I played water polo right before I started swimming with Salo and that kind of, I got fast right before he let me in his, his group and mm. play, from playing polo. And then his training style really was similar to what I was doing with water polo and I mean, I was the kind of kid that did like junior guards, water polo and swim practices all in one day in the summers, you know, and like mm. love the water, love to play. I love I'm not afraid of working hard and, and working for a long period of time, but mm -hmm. I am afraid of like the distance workouts <laughs> that yeah, I just yeah. I break down. Um, so his training approach was really hard, but different and fun and short and a lot of drills and speed. And it worked worked pretty well. I broke a world record my second year training with him and. Um, went to Cal, didn't do great. Um, a lot of information has come public about, you know, what that training experience was like since since now, but didn't do great at my time there, but I did meet my future husband and stuff. So I'm grateful that I did it um, and came back, swam with Salo and then broke a lot more world records and yes, <laughs> did good. Salo is a common denominator with the world records here. <laughs> yeah, awesome. um, I love that. Uh, you know, in terms of um, what you got from the training, like you said, it was, it was speed and drills. But I get the sense that you walked away from those practices happy every day. Like it was like like somebody was connecting with you in a sense of like that you were getting what you wanted and what you needed. And that's not to say that the practices aren't tough and hard. Yeah. Right? Like they're extremely exactly. tough and hard. Yeah. But it's but you're connecting with the practices themselves, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say every day I walked away happy. <laughs> Carrie can <laughs> Carrie can have my back on that one. I think, um, you know, not every day is easy. You don't want to get up and get in a cold pool and you don't always enjoy what your coaches ask you to do. But mm -hmm. I believed in his vision and believed in it for sure. Committed, right. bought in. Um, 
he went through cycles. You know, he doesn't like to admit it, but he became the head coach at USC. I knew him before that. So he kind of had to adapt a little bit to the leftover Schubert mindset of, you know, there were a lot of distance athletes on that team when he started and he had to kind of ease them down into a sprinter type training. So when I first started swimming with him at SC, it was more distance than I was used to from him. Um, and he kept a lot of that mindset. He had, I mean, Olympic gold medalists in, I think, so in 2012, I won a gold medal in the the medley relay, being a part of that. And Os won the mile. And I no, he won the open water 10K that same Olympics. And Os and I swam together every single day mm. um, at the same time. So we're training. I'm training for like the shortest possible races and he's doing the longest ones. So yeah, Salo had to kind of find a middle balance of, you know, getting, dis uh, getting distance workouts in. But yeah. it was not as much sprinting as it was for me in high school, for sure. That was more fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had a, a similar experience, I guess, when I took over at all, and I, I all of a yeah. sudden had to account for everybody, and and it does influence you in a way. And like I probably did more work with the sprinters in terms of volume than I I should have uh, yeah. at that time as well. Like you just make you make mistakes by because you're caught up in this head coaching role. And so I, I can I can see that where where Dave would have done something like that. Um, you did mention your your time at Cal. Are, are you where, where are you at with that in terms of publicly talking about your experience and there for the two years with Terry and, and what was going on? I haven't talked about it publicly ever before, but definitely didn't have a great um, experience at all. I, you know, you can see my performances were what they were not my best at all, but I struggled a lot with um, a lot of the, the stuff that, you know, just the emotional turmoil that the team was experiencing. And it was very real. Glad that a lot of it's being talked about. I'm proud of the girls that have come forward. I wasn't a huge, um, I didn't let myself really get caught up in a lot of the drama. You know, I'm, mm. I can just kind of keep my head down a little bit, but I hate seeing hurt happen to other people too. So um, yeah, it just, it was difficult to navigate and I left after two years. I tried to leave my freshman year. I wasn't released. Um, so I decided to go pro my second year and left and um, have some really good friendships from the school and really grateful. Obviously, my husband's an alumni. Like my kids are, my son just got put on a, a Berkeley baseball team. So we're really excited to hook up all the swim swag, you know, for all mm. the parents. Um, we're still grateful. I mean, I'm still a Bear Hay fan and I, Love Durden. He was he worked at the club team um, that I grew up with on Nova before, and I'm a huge fan of what's happening there with the program yeah. now. So definitely cheering for him. Yeah, he, Durden's doing a fantastic job. I spent some time with them over over Christmas, and uh, yeah, it was awesome to see. Yeah. Um, for sure. So in terms of your uh, relationship with Terry, was it was it ever abusive, like, or did it ever cross the line for you? I wasn't easy to navigate. I'm not going to say like I was abused. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to get involved in any of the legal stuff, but um, it was a difficult relationship and I'm not completely innocent. I wasn't a naive 18 year old kid navigating a lot of stresses myself. Mm -hmm. And I've apologized to her for anything that I did that was immature or not appropriate. I've apologized, um, you know, face to face to her. I'm at peace with the relationship. Yeah. But it was difficult and it continued to be difficult until the end of my career because she was on national team trips, picked relays. Um, you know, she was the head mm -hmm. coach of the Olympic team I was on. It was easy. It was difficult to navigate for sure. Yeah. Well, that's good that you've made peace with it at least and moved on yeah. from it. Definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, the stuff has come out and so people can read about it. We don't need to go on and on about it. Uh, yeah. Certainly not why I brought you on today either. You know, I want to <laughs> I want to celebrate your career. And that was just a part of it. Now. Going back, um, you know, once you did decide to go pro, like I said, apart from breaking world records as a younger kid, you have you do have tremendous success. You know, once you leave college and turn pro. So, um, when did it when did it click in? Was it around when did you leave college? Around two thousand and seven, was it? Yep, yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, right then. So yeah, so I guess you come down and then this training group you go into is is it formed at that point? Like all these breaststrokers that Salo mm -hmm. had these these women. I don't think so. Carrie might have a better memory than me. I have the memory of a goldfish, but I think <laughs> it happened within the next couple of years pretty quickly. Um, Stacyano was coaching at the time. She obviously was a big mentor for me growing up. I trained with her. Um, Carrie was there pretty quickly. Amanda Beard came. Rebecca was there already as a, a college student too. 
Um, so it was pretty intense, a good group yeah. of people. That is an intense group. Uh, I, I'd imagine, I don't know. I mean, talk to me about a, a breast or a group like that. I've had, a, I've had a male sprint group like that and it, it was tough to manage, but in terms of a female breaststroke group, what's that like? Everybody trained together. I was, um, the only sprinter. Amanda was kind of focusing on sprint too. So, um, I was the only sprint breaststroker at the time. So I got mm. left out of a lot of their intense, you know, the longer breaststroke event, uh, training sessions where, you know, mm. you're kind of more fatigued and snippy a little bit, but, um, it was fun. I think for the most part, we liked to race each other and we we're similar personalities. We like to also talk and we're social people. So we meshed pretty well. Um, I think it, it could be fatiguing. You have, you have bad days where you doubt yourself and you're not, especially in breaststroke. It's not, it's not like freestyle because I have both strokes. So I know what it's like to train with sprint freestylers too, a little mm. bit. And, um, Breaststroke is more like a golf swing, you know, like it's not about forcing it. It's about making the the rhythm and everything connect. Um, mm. and, and if you're off with your timing, it's so frustrating. It's like you just want to quit, you know, on your bad days. It's like you don't even feel like you know what you're doing because it's just if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You can't force it. So I think that would be difficult to manage for, for each of us on different times. And yeah, I think... I think that was hard. I mean, when you're off and doubting yourself, you don't want to see somebody breaking a world record and practice next to you, you know, <laughs> or like doing amazing things. And that happened all day, every day. So um, some of us struggled and some of us, um, we loved it for the most part, but it was not always easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much a similar experience that I found coaching that group of guys that I had around that same time. It's just, it's a difficult balance. You know, someone's going to be on one day, someone's going to be off and then, You've got to manage the, the different personalities within the group. How, how did um, Salo manage you in particular? How, how was he able to get the best out of you on race day? He's pretty hands off. Um, he really tries to enable athletes to kind of prep themselves to be the best they can be. Um, he folk, He's really detail oriented in, in crafting his practices and drills and all that kind of stuff. Um, so definitely more hands on during practices than other elite coaches, but hand, more hands off on race day than other coaches. So um, you would have to communicate with him if you needed extra help or, you know, needed mm. specific um, specific help on certain things. But I think, um, yeah, he, he empowered us to be confident with how we approach race days and to kind of prep ourselves. I think that's my interpretation of it. That's good. So he, he at least tried to stay neutral when it came to, yeah. who you know, he wasn't picking favorites of like, this one's my favorite breaststroker and this one I want to succeed. It was just like, girls, I'm training you go out there and race now. I think so. Yeah. I think he would get excited when he saw things in different people on different days. So you could tell wow. when he was pumped about something that one of us had done, but hmm. I definitely didn't feel like he had a favorite. Um, yeah. I don't think I personally don't think it was. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. Well, then well, tell us about 2008 um, in, in the lead up to the trials. Let's, let's just say, you know, in terms of advice that you would give someone in, in the lead up to an Olympic games, you know, you're preparing for 2008. How did you prepare yourself to be in the best uh, shape possible to compete at the trials itself in 2008? Um, yeah. I mean, this is the time of year where that work matters. Um, we're coming off of winter training camps right now where you got your butt kicked um, and the next couple of months are going to be hard, you know, we have NCAA championships, Doha. Uh, hopefully yeah. you guys can get a little dip in the training, you know, kind of coming up soon, but um, noses to the ground, working hard for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think the best piece of advice that I've picked up through working with a lot of different coaches on different opportunities throughout my career, I think is that you're a 24 seven athlete, you know, everything you do contributes to your performance, how you carry your backpack at school needs to be you know, you need to be have postural awareness on that, you know, the food mm. that you're eating, everything, every little bite. I have kids now with like, you know, goldfish crackers that they don't always finish. And I sometimes will catch myself popping them in my mouth as I'm cleaning up. And then I'm like, okay, every bite matters. You know, <laughs> if you eat like a handful of goldfish four times a day, it's going to eventually add up to be like a bigger than a bag worth of them. So, mm. um, you know, every bite matters. It's not to be like critical of, of what you're eating, but making sure that those are foods that fuel you and, and not just kind of mindless laziness. Um, right. 
And I think, I like yeah, that. all that stuff matters. I like that a lot. I talk about that a lot. You know, we, we, I, I talk about this this idea of volume, right, in the pool that that we're stuck on in swimming. And I say, well, there's what about the volume of work that you put in per day to be the best athlete you can be? Why don't we talk about that type of volume, right? Like, and and when you say everything matters, I love that, right? Everything does matter from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. You should be um, working towards being the best athlete that day, right? And that 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 means. You've got to do your mobility work, your stretching. Your, you've got to fill your water bottle up. You've got to drink your water. You've got to eat the right foods. You've got to have the right mindset. You've got to be doing the work in the pool. You've got to be um, massage. You've whatever it is that like the whole day. And like you even you even talked about carrying a, a book bag, right? Like mm -hmm. that's how sprinters think. Sprinters think is like, what is this going to do to affect my my speed, my strength, my performance, my agility, my flexibility. That's that to me is volume. And I think too often we're taught as swimmers to um, turn on and turn off because we're going to do 7000 yards in the pool. And that's the only thing that matters to be the best athlete you can be. But there's so much beyond that, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love, love I love everything you said there. And um, and that that does um, remind me of you. Like when I when I think of you as an yes. athlete. Uh, I always felt like you were just doing everything right. Like you were just on point Thanks. with everything. It was never, I never felt like you just were just turning on once you're in the pool, like everything you did outside the pool, you could see the way that you carried yourself. Like you were a professional athlete, you know? Thank you. It was fun yeah. times. Definitely fun. Yeah. So in the lead up to 2008, tell us about how you feel um, going into the trials. I was on top of the world right then. I think um, I, can't remember. Yeah, I went to Manchester Worlds, short course Worlds earlier that year and broke some world records, short course meters. Um, so was confident in my training environment at that point. And I, I would think it was safe to say I was a favorite going into at least the breaststrokes. I was swimming pretty fast all year with, with freestyle too. So I think people were, I was on the radar for freestyle, but confident, happy, having fun, excited. Yeah. Yeah, it was good times leading into trials that year. And then, and then once you're there, like you've done the work, you feel strong, you feel powerful. Once you're there, what is it like? Like, what's the experience like to try and make a U.S. Olympic team? My first trials was in 04. <clears throat> they were in Long Beach, where I'm from, where I grew up. So right. um, that was crazy. I yeah. uh, it was seven, 16, 17, and uh, I think I was seated in the 70s, 72nd, something. Mm. I'm not sure. That's not fact, but that's what I remember. At least I wasn't a favorite. <laughs> ended up getting just so excited and so much support from my hometown that I ended up getting fifth, I think, fifth mm. or sixth, uh, made the final, almost made the team in 04. And I was literally out of nowhere. And then I broke world record in high school the next year. So it was my second, oh, it was my second trials after that. Um, yeah. And yeah, definitely. It wasn't as scary the second time, you know. Um, it was in Omaha, not in my hometown, middle, kind of middle of the country, not as intimidating location wise. Um, but it was still crazy. There's, there's a lot mm. of pressure to make the team, right. And it's internal. It's not anyone else's pressure except for myself, but, um, there's, you know, fireworks on deck. There's cameras in your faces. That's there's what I was going to say. Like Omaha, you know, Omaha became an event, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was crazy. Um, so yeah. I kind of tried to block it all out as much as I could and just focus on swimming the two laps of breaststroke, you know, that I needed to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I made it in the hundred breaststroke. Um, and then after that, it became even more fun. Once you make the team, your the rest of your, your races are just kind of like, you have all the confidence you need. Uh, the pressure's off. Um, you know, you hit your taper, you know, everything's, you know, kind of clicking and yeah, it's so fun. The next yeah. couple of races are even better. Yeah, yeah. So that that's awesome. I mean, you you make the Olympic team and you're off to to Beijing. When did uh when did everything change beyond that? Yeah, I was like halfway through training our domestic training camp, so a couple weeks in, two or three weeks into our domestic camp, got a phone call during a nap that my drug test from trials had come back positive. So wow. uh that changed everything really fast for sure. Wow, so you're you're taking a nap, you just get a phone call, who called you? Lindsay Mantenko was our manager at the time. And wow. I mean, to get a phone call to say you have to like come to her room, you know, and interrupt mm -hmm. a nap at a training camp for the Olympics. I knew something was serious then. And I can tell by the tone in her voice instantly, you know, it was, in, I knew instantly. 
that so you get changed real quick and you you head to her room who who's in the room when you when you enter I just think just Lindsay um, talked to USADA's CEO, Travis Tiger on the phone. And he told me that I had tested positive and to get a lawyer. And I tried to like understand how, you know, in that moment, I had no idea. It took a long time to figure it all out, but um, call you know, had to have some help finding a, a lawyer and came home the next day from training camp. Um, didn't get to say goodbye to anybody. It was kind of like, put a, a pillowcase over my head and get out of there. Um, really? Yeah. It was kind of sent home, but yeah, you're treated guilty until you can prove your innocence in those situations. So I had to go home and fight for my innocence from that moment forward. Yeah. I've had a couple of people on um, who have had similar experiences to you. And, um, but I mean, I guess, I guess that's just a, a major shock. Like, are you just running through your head of like the things that could have happened yeah. here? Yeah, I had no clue. Um, and now, you know, now having gone through it and understanding the bigger picture, <clears throat> I mean, if you if you look into all the ways an athlete can, can be exposed to contamination, it's insane. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I looked into as much, you know, when it took, I think, half a million dollars worth of my savings to, to figure out where it did come from, you know, and grateful that I had that in reserves from all those world records I had already broken. I saved it. So... I'm grateful. I mean, I had the money and the resources. My dad's an aviation and intellectual attorneys, uh, intellectual property attorney. So mm -hmm. he understood the legal system. My mom's a psychotherapist, helped me approach it psychologically to, to survive. Mm -hmm. And my sister was on our junior national team for water polo. So she kept the competitive connection going too. So I had the best support system possible. Literally couldn't have survived it without my people. How did you actually find the source of the contamination in the end? So we had, I hired an attorney. He hired um, a lab. It's Don Catlin. He, he basically is the guy that exposed Lance Armstrong now too. He's like the best in the business. Um, hired him to test the nutritional supplements and the prescription medicine that I was taking. Uh, we looked into like water contamination in Omaha, food. Um, so we looked into everything we could think of. And six months later, Don found um, the supplements were contaminated. So I had wow. had some evidence to take and fight, you know, for my my case to be reinstated. Thankfully, and, and then ultimately you had to fight against the um, the nutritional uh, supplement the companies. Yep. Yeah, they actually sued me for defamation first. So um, oh, I good. countersued them. Obviously, once I had some evidence, and then. The attorneys combined those lawsuits. It actually went to trial, I think, right before the Olympics in 2012. Um, so we wow, settled. Took that long. Yeah, we settled outside of court because of the timing. Um, I'm a little bit bummed about it because I would have loved to get that kind of more closure. Um, but yeah, it ended up working out just fine. You know, I got to go to the Olympics and have a clear, <laughs> clear, you know, played off my the the weight off my shoulders a little bit too. So I was grateful. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. A lot of the times, uh, the the athletes aren't as lucky as you. They don't find the yeah. source of the contamination. Whereas you're yeah. fighting for your name and for your your, you know your your livelihood. And here, you ultimately find the source of the contamination. And, and against the you know, like you said, the company's like, no way, we could have done this. We're going to sue for defamation. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, you actually did do this. That's mm -hmm. it's crazy, isn't it? I don't think it, I, I personally don't think it's malicious um, that their stuff was contaminated or, or in when this happens to athletes, I don't always think the cause of the positive test is a malicious, right. um, you know, negligence, right. but yeah, it's so, I mean, I got, I, everything that happened to me was lucky, you know, I don't, I would not have survived it. The embarrassment and the, the level of publicity that it happened, you know, surrounding yeah. the Olympic games, um, was enough. I mean, I was suicidal to be completely frank. It was enough to end somebody. So without my mom keeping my head on straight and my stepdad understanding the legal world to help advocate and fight, it was like the biggest legal battle you can imagine. Mm. So yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky. And I, and yeah. I know that a lot of athletes aren't. So yeah, it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, I had Shana Jack on here, the Australian sprinter, and she went through something very similar. I don't, I don't think in the end she was able to find the source, but uh, yeah. you know, she fought just as hard as you did, and she she got ultimately got got her name cleared from it. But she she said very similar things, you know, like when she was alone, she was she was in a very very dark place. She needed people around her because otherwise, the, those 
times where it was just her um i don't know if she she felt about suicide but in terms of like you know possible harm and things like that you it probably crosses your mind doesn't it yeah yeah your whole reality gets shook right like people are aggressively calling you a bad person and attacking mm. your character and your morals your judgment that kind of stuff is deep it's deeper than your athletic performance the kind of stuff mm. that gets said about who you are is just crazy so Thankfully, I had a really good support system that I could lean on and ask for help. And I really, really needed a lot of help during that time. And they they kept me standing up, you know, with my feet underneath me. And I focused on the things I could control personally, like I can, can compartmentalize really well. So I put my emotion into my training um, and it showed, you know, my performance showed that when I came back off my suspension and I'd found the positives and I learned a lot from it. I'm a better person now because of it, um, undoubtedly. So, you know, if, if you, I mean, it's, it's relatable to everyone in the world has gone through, if they haven't yet, they're going to go through something that shakes who they are as a person and mm -hmm. challenges their mor morals and helps them kind of grow. For me, it was a life defining experience. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. And, and, You've written a book about it, which is great. People can can get that. Where where can people get the book that you wrote, by the way? Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, What's it called? Swimming toward the the gold lining. Okay. Nice. How Jessica? Get it how I turned my wounds into wisdom. There we go. A lot to learn there, and um, that's cool. Um, yeah. H have you had people reach out to you from that book and and say that's had an impact on them? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. difficult for me. I still like get shaky and. Uh, cry when I talk about it, you know, uh, some, I, very frequently, I still am emotional about the whole experience. So really? I actually don't even like talk, you know, look into the book or performance or promote it or do anything because it's a wound for me still, but mm. yeah, the people who have reached out, I'm glad that it can be helpful. And even if it just helps one person, it did its job. Yeah. What about 2008? Is that uh, the Olympics themselves? Is that a wound? Were you able to watch that? Are you able to look at it now? And, and how do you feel about it? I watched a little Dom, my husband, um, we were dating at the time. Uh, he was there and swam amazing. So mm. I definitely watched his performances and I trained with a lot of people that were in Beijing too. So watched, followed all my friends. Um, but yeah, it was very, very hard. I mean, yeah. very hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well then, uh, as dark as 2008 was, I guess, uh, 2012 is kind of a light, you know, shine light for you where, you were able to go out and make the Olympic team again and have some performances at that games. How, how talk, talk to us about 2012 then. Yeah, I made it. Um, so 2012 trials, I got third in the hundred breaststroke, the, my first race of the meet. So I didn't mm. make breaststroke my best event. Um, and that shook me again, you know, cause I fought so hard to get the opportunity to make it. And then I got third where they only take two, um, and that really is a testament to how nervous and emotional and mm. scarred I was kind of in that moment. But um, I realized, you know, thanks to my coaches and family, realized that I had nothing left to lose and to, to just swim free after that. And I did. I, I swam freestyle and I got, I think I won the 100 free at trials and second in the 50 free. I don't know. Maybe I won both. Can't remember. But I made it in both. And um, yeah, I got to go to the Olympics in my second best event. And mm um did great so the relays we got a bronze in the foreigner free relay and i got a gold swimming on the medley relay prelim so got some medals yeah. finaled in both my individual races which is great for them not really being my best stroke um was happy with it did best times had a good time it was fun my husband was there we were engaged mm. at the time nice. they're just kind of a good closure you know peaceful yeah. ending to the process yeah yeah london london was a, a fun olympics too cool one um awesome to be part of that u.s team was a strong team as well yeah wonderful yeah. team yeah what is it like to compete for the u.s i mean i i i put the australian cap on so i don't know in terms of uh, being a u.s athlete what does it feel like to be a u.s athlete mm -hmm. Um, the Olympics is cool. It's different from the other, you know, national teams that you're on because you're there with like the NBA players and the tennis players and they're superstars mm. in the village, you know. So that was the the one competition where it it was pretty cool to be American, I'd say. The other ones, I, I did a lot of international travel. I, I was in, married now to a Swiss swimmer. So um, I spent more time with 
you know, international exposure, I think, than most Americans do and didn't really see, you know, the whole mindset of we're better than everyone else that a lot of Americans have. I think it's we're definitely one of the largest teams every year and have had really dominant performances. So I'm proud of that. But um, a lot of other countries do stuff just as well and if not better than us. And I appreciate learning from everybody. And I love learning cultures and languages and stuff, too. So I'm not buying into that whole like <laughs> little proud American thing as much. But um, it was fun. A lot of support. You have everything you need from nutritionists, psychologists, um, coaches with all these different strengths and backgrounds and um, massage therapists, a lot of um, swag. I think that's different mm. for the U.S. We get a lot mm. of stuff uh, yeah. support wise. So that's that's really nice. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, it, it's it's definitely just a, a massive team. Like you said, you know, you're there with all these superstar athletes. And so. I'd imagine having that American flag does feel special, even though you might not buy into the whole American thing. It's it's definitely a special feeling to be represented by that type of unit, you know, like you guys going in as a unit. I remember the the basketball team coming in to the village and, and just sitting down and just being being cool with everybody, you know, like yeah. they felt like they were part of uh, something special too, you know. It's, yeah, that's the best part, I think. You know, it's yeah. just everyone respects each other. We all worked our butts off to get there, no matter yeah. how much money your sport pays you, right? Everyone yeah. respects each other. Um, yeah, it was a cool experience. What about um, the the time from the trials to the Olympics themselves? What are you doing in that period? How do you, how do you peak the trials and then swim faster at the Olympics? I think it's different. I mean, sprinters is not as challenging in my opinion. <clears throat> um, sprinters, we, I personally don't like to get so beat up to where I can't mm -hmm. swim fast most year round. Um, right. So I did a little bit of beat up work after trials, maybe a week or two max, but um, just kind of fine tune into the, the events that you were selected to compete with, you know, fine tune into the different specifics that, you know, can make you better at it. Um, prep for relays was a big one for sprinters. Um, yeah, and just dial in with your your training group. I think it trials is a unique experience where you really are, you know, almost enemies with the people you're racing against at trials because you need to make a spot um, and they're in the way of that, you know. So everyone looks at each other as an obstacle to overcome. Um, and then as soon as you make the team, you flip the switch that you're all of a sudden teammates, you're training mm -hmm. together every day, you need each other to do well, to do well on relays. So it like your whole mindset changes to enemies to teammate, you know, pretty quickly. And the, the training, the Olympic training camp is really fun, you know, because everyone is coming together and supportive and supporting each other and pushing each other to do things that you've never seen done before. I remember training camp practices with like Phelps and Lochte going head to head that I just saw stuff that were, it, I didn't think it was humanly possible, you know, and, mm -hmm. and doing stuff myself with Dara Torres at camps that were not humanly possible. <laughs> I mean, it was, it's fun, you know, yeah. working together is fun. When are we going to get uh, 50s of stroke at the Olympics? When, when are we going to crown a 50 breaststroke Olympic champion? I can't believe they have met mixed gender relays before they put 50s in. Like, I Thank can't yeah. believe it. Yeah, it makes no sense. Like, no, you don't train for a mixed gender relay. You just turn up to the event and somebody decides, hey, you're going to swim breaststroke, you're going to swim fly, and here you go, go out and win a gold medal. Like, you don't do any preparation for it. Yeah, and it's like – you don't even know who's selected for it until yeah. you see like who's tired and who wants to volunteer for it. You know, yeah, it's like, exactly. it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. And by putting Olympic gold medals on these things where uh, like the 50 breaststroke is an actual trained event that you can train for and become Olympic champion in. Yeah, you should be. Yeah. Yeah. You should be. I, I don't know why we, we haven't got that yet. Uh, I agree with you. I'm going to keep fighting for it until They're we not. get it. They're not listening <laughs> to us. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> you should have one. Do you think you would have had a shot at winning that if, if there was one? I would have made sure I had a shot at winning that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it wasn't anyone as fast as they, you. If they time. ever do put it in, I mean, I might, you might I'll have to hold back. me back from trying to hop <laughs> in. I'm not going to lie. The 50 yeah. breast is such a fun event. Heck yeah. yeah. Serious. What is the key to a, a fast um, breaststroke swim? You know, because I know like 
I, I always found with my breaststroke is if they if they tried too hard, if they pulled too hard, they just wouldn't go anywhere. So what's the secret to a fast uh, breaststroke? Turnover, yeah. I think water polo taught me that, how to still hold water while spinning, you know, right. according right. to most coaches. So I think for me, it was just um, not thinking and just like letting my body go um, mm. and trying to win. I mean, you do all the training and practice, and I think – making sure that athletes in practice have the opportunity to find that race um, opportunity, you know, where they're, mm -hmm. they're practicing over speed, you know, if it's right. breaking the stroke down into like an over kick or over arm, easy kick type of a situation or with bungee cords, assisted speed type stuff, um, letting them practice over speed and then, you know, encouraging them to turn their brain off and just let their bodies do what they're, they're used to doing once they get into that especially for a 50, you don't have to think about anything. It's over so fast, you know? So yeah, you might disagree. 50 freestylers, I think, are a little more cognitive. I think you guys. Uh, no, I think you're right. You said something very important there. You said kind of turn your brain off and let your body take over. And I think that's the key to, to any fast swimming is just allow it to happen, um, allowing your body to take over. Ultimately, you, you've got to turn the the little words off, the little, the little yeah. chirping in your head, you know, do this, do that, do that, do that. It's like you got to turn all that out and just let your body take over. Now, in order to be able to take over, you have to have done the training, you know, yeah. you have to train the specificity and at certain speeds and at certain rates and tempos that has to all be locked in. But now once you get behind the block, you got to turn that brain off and let the body take over. Yeah, it's instinctual, you know, fight or flight, go out there, right. win, you know, that's all yep. you need to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're the best swims. Now, in terms of that, what's the most memorable world record you broke? Definitely the um, 2009 US Open. My first big meet after my suspension was over. Um, it was super suit era, but I ended up going out there and I broke the 50 brushstroke world record in mm. route to breaking the 100 brushstroke world record in the same race at my wow. first meet back after missing Beijing. So a lot of emotion, um, wow. a lot of anger and gratitude and um, yeah, the hard work that I channeled into the water, you know, focusing on what I can control during that experience, it paid off in that moment, completely worth it. I was okay again, free again, and, and loved the sport, you know, grateful. Oh yeah. Yeah. You were jacked up for that stream. Like, like yeah. come on, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Where, where was it at? In Seattle, federal way. Federal way. So you broke the, you broke the 50 world record on the hundred in the same swim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You hear about that in like distance events, maybe like the 800 towards the 1500 or something, but like very rarely. And then I've never actually heard about it in a, in a hundred before. Yeah. You're welcome. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> I mean, wild. it was super, it was suited. So it was a rubber suit and everyone was breaking world records all the time. Yeah, so of course they were. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It was fun. I mean, Had we, a blast. we did what we, 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 we took what everyone, you know, gave us at the time. It's like, if everybody's yeah. in a suit, we're all racing in suits, you know, it's yeah. like, that's what, what it was so yeah it, it is pretty crazy though that it's not crazy in the sense that people have broken a lot of those world records but in terms of what is humanly possible like to see to see us progress to the point where again like a, someone said the other day like all of phelps's world records are gone now phelps doesn't have a world record anymore it's crazy isn't it yeah that is crazy yeah i mean yeah. Uh, that did you find that ever in your in your swimming that you know once you saw somebody do something you you felt more confident or able to do something yeah i was lucky to train with like a lot of yeah. really good people um right. especially the men i saw stuff i mean i saw what they were doing in training and then how it translated to races and i really mm. i got a lot of confidence from that you know if i can keep up with them and practice for certain aspects and components um that i knew certain things were possible in my races so um i used a lot of the middle distance guys for their opening speed to pace myself and yeah i think that increased my uh, mental capacity of what women can do for sure mm. what do you think the key is you know, to women getting ultimately much faster in sprint freestyle we've been hanging around kind of 23 8 for a while james gibson believes in himself that once females really master the straight arm freestyle really understand it and do it well that we're going to see significant drops how, how do we get women to go from 23 high to maybe 23 low or even maybe even possibly under 23 what's what's your opinion on that man i'm a 24 person back in the day so <laughs> those times are great to me but i think yeah i think i was a straight arm you know advocate too. water polo shaped my mm. stroke so um you know 
thrashing for the ball above the surface with straight arm and um, egg beatering helped my breaststroke under the water too. So I'm grateful that I just got lucky and instinctively did straight arm and, and really found a lot of speed come naturally from it. And I think, mm. I think that age groupers in the U S aren't even taught straight arm freestyle. You know, it does put your shoulder at, you know, risk for injury. I tore my labrum. So I can say that it does hurt your shoulders, but you know, that's how you go. That's how you, that's how it's going to happen. I agree with them. You tore your labrum from straight on freestyle, you think? Yeah. Really? What were yeah. you doing? Sprinting. <laughs> I <laughs> Wait, mean, did I you have a resistance on or did you? No, it, um, I took a break after London, um, came back and just went into like the World Cup straight away and just, I twerked it, tweaked it too hard, uh, you know, training full speed without really being in shape for it, for okay. sure. Something I, I remember a certain practice it happened and. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Kind of out of shape a little bit and doing things a yeah. little too fast, maybe. Yeah. 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 There's definitely progressions that you got to get to to the point where you can be that explosive and that powerful as well. Yeah. Stabilization exercises are important. Mm. You know, right. shoulder health, that kind of stuff is, especially, right. I mean, we're just in swimming, you're doing repetitive overhead motion that puts you at risk for injury. So, yeah. The stabilization stuff, you can't skip it. What about in terms of your your strength? Did you feel like you were strong in the gym that translated into the pool or not? Yeah, I put on muscle very easily. I'm I'm definitely one of those athletes that can, you know, lift easily. Um, yep. So I tried to not do too much in the gym. I didn't want to be too heavy. Um, in college, I worked with Nick Falker. He is a, the best in the business at the time and really got strong with him, like lifted more mm. than Dom, my husband for a while. Oh. Um, but I felt heavier in the water. So right. I tried to find a good balance of applicable strength long, you know, like longer, um, stretched out type of movements rather than just bulk speed in the gym. Yeah. But I think every athlete's different and every athlete has different needs and balances, strengths and weaknesses, how it translates for them is different in the water. So I think the more in tune with your body you can be, I think that's how yeah. you kind of navigate that. Yeah, for sure. What about these days? What are you, what are you up to these days? I'm having shoulder surgery finally next month. Um, oh, wow. But yeah, I, I work uh, in sporting goods. I run the swimming division at the, the largest sporting goods company in the U.S. Um, so I do sales, marketing, and merchandising, kind of oversee all of that. Um, still get to talk to all my swim coach friends. It's really fun. Love my job. Um, I work from home. So I also have two young kids that are four and about to be six and mm. getting them water safe, slowly transitioning into actual strokes. And my daughter's on her surf team and stuff. So nice. trying not to coach my kids <laughs> is harder <laughs> than it's, than I thought it would be and staying busy, having fun. Yeah. What about, um, you know, Dom was kind of more middle distance, you were sprint and, and the kids, which way are they going to go? You think? Um, I don't know. My son is definitely explosive. I definitely nice. see, I see nice. some sprint ability in him. My yes. daughter has my husband's body, so I think she might be more middle distance, but right. she's, more, then. she's more coordinated and more athletic than my son. Where yeah. That usually means you're not a good swimmer if you're good at other sports. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We'll now, see. Two Olympic, two Olympic swimmers as, as parents. Do you, do you, I mean, do you want your kids to swim? Obviously, like you said, water safety is one thing, but being a swimmer is something completely different. Do you, as parents, do you want your kids to be swimmers? Dom definitely does. He will be the first to say he bred his oh. kids for one reason, to swim, but I don't wow. think I want them to. I had a lot of obstacles and, and you know, experiences that were difficult, and I don't want to see my kids go through pain like that. So um, <clears throat> if they do swim, it's, it's going to be because they want to, not because of us at all, you know? Mm. So Dom's going to be the one getting up for morning practice. Though. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> we're sprinters. We don't need to do that anyways. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, afternoon practice only, Dom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Well, that's cool. Listen, it's been it's been awesome to catch up with you and just go over some of your stuff in your career. There's so much to learn there. The book's there. People can read it. But, um, you know, if you were just to give one final piece of advice for all the people preparing for at least the, the the u.s olympic trials i mean it's not that far away we're like we're almost in february it's it's in june so it's like it's it's very very close what's the what's the final push for you in terms of advice i mean i see it <clears throat> firsthand right now i'm i'm the mom of toddlers that are experiencing joy every time they jump in the water they're so happy just to swim um 
And I think that every elite athlete has that experience, you know, an elite swimmer has had that experience where they just love the water. And that's kind of where the foundation of why they put in all that hard work comes from. Um, mm. You're just, you have to stay connected to that, that inner youth and the inner joy of why you're doing it. You know, you love the water and remember that on the hard days, on the scary days, on the important days, just go back to that kind of that, you know, your instincts of you love the water and you like to race, you like to win and enjoy it. Cause you know, I'm old now. I don't know how much of this is applicable still. I'm an old person, but I'm still so grateful for, for that joy, you know, and the love of racing. So enjoy it while you're in it. Well, that's, that's good advice. And it's definitely, um, it's needed in this point in time because there's a lot of stress and a lot of pressure in, in the lead up to a trials. Um, one last piece of advice for once you're there, how do, how do you get the best performance out of yourself in an environment that is so foreign to you where the, you know, there's a massive stadium of people now, there's fire, there's flames, there's announcers, there's live on television, it's all that sort of stuff. You can't really prepare for that as a, as an athlete because you just turn up to practice every day. And then all of a sudden you get into this environment. It's like, wow. So what's, what's the advice for once you're on the pool deck at trials? I'm not going to say I'm a master at that because I went through ups and downs just like everyone does. But the the ups that I experienced were they came when I focused on just what I needed to do in the water. So only focus on what you're doing. You know, I swam two laps maximum. You're swimming two laps and you've done that race three million times. Um, oh. Just do what you need to do. Don't focus tune the tune the rest of it out as much as you can, um, yeah. you know, and enjoy it once you're done racing because it's yeah. it's fun. It's supposed to be good. Yeah. Good stuff. I love it. Well, appreciate this. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, good, good, good catch up. And uh, we live close. We're just down yeah. the road, so we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get together and do something. Love right? to. Welcome to the yeah. hood. It's so excited you guys are here, and great mm -hmm. to see you. Super grateful for all the sprint yeah. advocating you're doing. I support yeah. the cause and got your back. I love it. Well, good. We'll keep pushing then. Thanks for doing this today. You too. Good to see you. All right. Bye.